Welcome everyone to Email Marketing 201, part of our series of digital marketing, taking it to the next level beyond the basics. This session is hosted by the Mississauga Business Entrepreneur Center, part of the Economic Development Office here at the City of Mississauga. So the Mississauga Business Entrepreneur Center, otherwise known as MBAC, is your central source for small business information, resources, and guidance. As I mentioned, we're part of the Mississauga Business Economic Development Office, and we are focused on supporting small businesses. There's a whole team of us. We're working remotely and here to serve you um, between Monday and Friday, 9 to 5. We offer free business information and guidance, webinars such as this, workshops, resources and tools um, online, and training and mentorship programs as well as entrepreneurship programs. So if you want to learn about more and how to contact us as well, mississauga.ca slash MBEC is the only URL you have to remember. And a little bit of background for me, I started my first business when I was 19 and uh, was in a family business before that. So I've gone through two or three, worked for a tech startup after I sold my first business 20 years. Um, I had that and it was a bike shop. We kind of grew it from a little rental shop up to a little adventure store. Um, and now I think it's still going and uh, it's looking good. So mountain bikes, we had road bikes, we had all that great stuff. It was great, even got into off-road running and stuff. Um, and then I worked for a tech startup for a couple of years, which was really exciting. I learned a lot um, and then went back, did my communications because that was my forte. And I truly believe that communications is the foundation of success for any organization. So I went back and I, I did some extra schooling and have been a digital marketing consultant with the city for four years, but a communication strategist for about eight or so um, and love it. And here to help you today as part of that, with the email marketing. You can connect with me online and I hope you do. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook and reach out to me directly afterwards if you want a one-on-one -on -one or want to learn more about our programs. I'm at laura.dunkley at mississauga.ca. This is the agenda for today. First, we're going to talk about that customer journey because we want to give that whole idea from beginning to end because email marketing is not just at the front end, even though that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. It's understanding how your customer interacts with you throughout your business. And then we are going to talk about that email list building. And I'm sure most of you, because you are startups, um, are going to um, really want to focus on that. So we will talk about that first level a lot today. We're also going to talk about sequencing and automation. This is the magic. This is where you can be productive and uh, save a lot of time. Um, and then audience, that list building, once you really things to consider when you're building out an audience, including the setup, and then how to manage that quality list. And some performance tips. And of course, measuring success. As everyone knows, I'm a bit of a uh, metrics junkie, so we are definitely going to talk about that and putting together an email marketing plan. We're going to talk about a little scenario that I use throughout all of my digital marketing sessions, and we're just going to continue it. Um, so we'll give you an idea of what that looks like. And as I mentioned, there's a few handouts as well. And we'll end it off with tools and some key takeaways for you to use. So let's get started. Just as a reminder for any of you who haven't started yet or not sure if it's worth the effort, these stats are meant to inspire you. There are over 4 billion email users and they continue to grow. So it's a huge opportunity for you to do for your business and as you market. And 99% of those email users check their inbox every day, every day. So that's really important in as far as frequency considerations and things like that. And typically they check it first thing in the morning. Friday is globally the best day to send emails. Now you have to understand anytime you will see stats, these are just meant to be benchmarks. You have to spend your time getting to know your audience. So as much as Friday is very generally a good one, um, I have seen stats that say differently. So please go and understand your industry and do your own audience um, research. And 16.97% and is the average open rate for all industries. 
and that does make sense. I've seen them as low as 3%, 4% for some industries, and then I've seen them as high as up to 30%. So again, know your industries. A lot of the softwares will let you um, see what industry norm is and they'll present it to you. And you can even go online and see different industry standards. So start with that if as part of your plan to set your goals. And then another stat for inspiration, many, Business owners say that for every dollar they spend, they get $42 return on investment, which is a pretty good uh, return on investment. So the customer journey, these are, you'll see these a little different across the board, but basically it's just taking you through the time that you get your subscribers in all the way to the time you, you know, you want to keep them. So this is the sandwich. So we build our email list. We want to nurture them through, and then we want to convert them to customers. And then the whole idea of retention, making sure they stay And email marketing plays a role in all of them. So what does that look like? Subscribe and welcome. This is that key one. We're going to talk about more on this one and those kinds of emails. What is that going to look like? Basically, it's when someone signs up for your form, you're going to send them through to a thank you page. You're going to see opt in confirmation emails. Thank you emails, welcome emails. All of those are sort of in that building. It's like you have that 1st impression. This is something. Um, is important for that first impression. And then as you go through and it's like you have your list. Okay, so now we need to nurture them. Let's let's give them some value. Let's send them some promotions. Let's uh, think about lead generation opportunities. Maybe it's a download. Um, maybe you're promoting events. Maybe you're doing an announcement. Or maybe if you're a not-for-profit, it's a donation campaign. So all of those are campaigns. You're taking your list that you have and is continuing to grow and you want to start to nurture them and give them that value. And then when we're starting to think about converting them to sales um, or the actual, so this is trying to get them in to, to become customers. And then through that customer one, and the reason it's a sales color is because it's a little outside your email marketing, but I want to include this because as an entrepreneur, when you do everything, you have to think of the whole picture. If you're coming from a large organization doing email marketing and you have a whole team, make sure that this is one system that you have good communication and you're talking through them and you think through the customer journey with them together because marketing and sales work very closely together. Emails that you will see here are abandoned cart, follow up from the lead generation, and then any of the different ones through the sales funnel schedule, you know, as you move them through that funnel. If you're a B2B, which many of you are, that say, um, the consultation sales funnel, you want to make sure those emails go through to the final part where they actually get the quote and they accept the quote. And then after they become your customer, you want to send emails such as order confirmation, thank you, track shipment, many e-commerce, this is very critical and you can do autoresponders. If you're not e-commerce and you are a sales focus, maybe you're professional services, you just don't have the same kind of process, but track shipment, maybe you're doing a, a download or they have a, purchase software from you, or they've had a consultation, you want to send them a thank you. It just might be a little more difficult to auto respond to that and it may be customized, but please consider this part of the journey as well. And then you also want to make sure that you don't lose them. So if you haven't had a customer for a year, or they haven't engaged with your emails, you want to make sure that you keep them interested and you keep them on board. We're going to have a whole section coming up on this re-engagement and that you want to, this is the quality list part. This is where you want to keep everyone interested. And there's some tips and tricks on how to do that. And at the end, maybe some of your subscribers have moved on. They're not um, interested in what you're doing anymore. There's various reasons why that may be but you want to find out what those reasons are because it could just be that they don't want to get as many emails or something came, who knows what that is, but the part of this email is, and this can be auto-generated, if they unsubscribe or they go to unsubscribe, you can send them to a landing page or an email where they can actually, you can request them to update their profile. So maybe you have a larger organization and cats and dogs, say, for one instance, say you're a pet store and you, or, and you have customers for cats um, and customers for dogs. And then what you, 
then all of a sudden somebody doesn't have a dog anymore and they go, oh, I don't want the emails. So then maybe you can redirect them and say, well, hey, did you know we do this as well? Or maybe you want to just change your preferences, find a way to keep them on board. I have some ideas on what that looks like and it's coming up. So that customer journey is a, a great reference as far as the different types of emails to use. And so how do we build that quality email list? Right at the beginning is that subscribe, um, subscribe and welcome piece, right? Like that is really important. And where do we find those ways to get emails at that point? And many of you will be like that. The first and foremost is your website. Please make sure you do this. It, it costs you typically no money if you're already paying for your website hosting. So you wanna go through, and we're gonna do that on the website 201, talk a little more, more about that. Do a bit of a website audit. Are your forms working? Do you have a pop-up? Is the timing working right on your pop-up? Is it beside your blog? Is it is it through all of your pages? Please go through and make sure that your website is prepped and primed to be able to gather that email information and then test it. Put it in there, making sure you, you check all the notifications, the settings in your website, and then make sure it's integrated properly with your email service. That is crucial. And then there's also ways to do advertising. There's social media, LinkedIn, um, contact us. Um, there's on Facebook, subscribe to our email. There's actually campaigns you can go out to do that. Um, and so that's the paid stuff as well as making sure you're free. So when we have advertisements, which could be Google ads even, um, then there's social media. So always think first and foremost, free first, optimize your free opportunities, and then pay to supplement. Um, event registration, many of you who signed up through event, Eventbrite for us, there was an option on that to sign up for our newsletter. That is where we can capture people, you guys, who want to stay on our newsletter, and those will get imported as well. Word of mouth, there's podcasts. If you have a physical sales space, there are a few retailers on the call. If that's the case, make sure you have something printed, maybe at the point of sale. Um, that that is a little thing, a QR code that they can scan and you don't want to miss out on that. I've been working a lot. I, I was a retailer. That was my specialty. And I do, there is a world that we have to remember that that offline and online, it's harder now because it's mostly online, but don't forget that as we move through and now we're truly in that hybrid in-person and online, that you think of physical as well as online and put those things in place to be able to gather subscribers and print. Um, sometimes print does make sense, whether it's a newspaper, but we always say when you do print, it's costly, it's hard to track, make sure that you get them online as soon as possible, even if you give them a code um, to do a certain things too. There's bit.ly's and things like that you can start to track. But those are a lot of places where you can start to get it at that very early stage. But it's not the only place where you can build your email list through your marketing campaigns. When you send out your newsletter, make sure it's easy to share, that you even have maybe a call to action, sign up. Because what happens is, is if your friend decide, or that someone says, hey, this is a really good product, and they share it with someone else, you want to have some type of call to action that, hey, subscribe, do you wanna be on this list? So don't forget that even during marketing campaigns, there's an opportunity to build your list. Sign up for a new list. This is where you can update the um, profiles. Maybe there's, this is part of that re-engagement campaign at the end too, but there is a way if you have a new list or a segmentation. Lead generation forms, if you do a whole marketing campaign around a download, um, perhaps, that makes sure within that lead generation form, that you have the option at the bottom where it says subscribe to our news list. Because if you ask them to provide you with an email, because that's what you want, right? Is you want the first name, last name, email address, and maybe some other industry information when they do a download. Um, that doesn't mean that you can add them to your marketing list. This is part of that Canadian anti-spam law, and it's really just good practice. You want to always make sure you identify what they're doing and what, what you're going to offer them. So if that download form 
says you're going to send them the download, make sure you put an option in there to be able to say, hey, would you also like to subscribe to our monthly newsletter or our email list? And then they can click on it. That way you can opt in and you get express consent. So that is a great opportunity in your um, marketing campaigns. And as I mentioned too, don't forget your other contact forms. So if they're contacting you just for general reasons or as a business consultation, maybe you're doing a discovery call, you can get them to fill out all that information and go, hey, and don't forget that we um, also have a newsletter. Would you like to opt into it? Maybe that initial form isn't right, but maybe it triggers something where they, an email gets followed up and says confirmation. You've now booked your you've now booked your appointment with us. Would you also like to subscribe to our newsletter? It's you have to really think it through, and that's where that planning piece comes in. But don't forget the marketing campaigns to do that. When it comes to sales, email signatures, um, the initial reach out. Maybe you're talking to someone and you say, "Hey, did." Uh, if you're not ready to purchase, would you like to stay on our newsletter? Verbal consent is also consent based for Castle. You just have to document it. So you would, I would hope you would have notes. You do have to document it in case somebody comes back. But it is a place to say, would you like to join our email list? Um, and then also through all the different follow-up consultations calls. It just depends on your sales strategy. And then the follow-up afterwards too. Just remember that as as a customer, you are able to communicate with them. That is what we call implied consent for Castle. And within a certain period of time, even after they're not your customer, you can still email them, but there is a window um, that you have. It's not hard and fast. You do have to follow the Castle. Um, I will send out the email to that as well. well. I don't have the link on here. It is in our email marketing 101. We talk more about Castle. But what happens is after that implied consent time, if you go 10 years later and go, hey, I have this old email list, don't go and send it to them. You can't do that. They can actually say, they can report you. So just be really careful that during that implied consent period that you actually try and you do some type of engagement where you get them onto your express consent email list. And then in that re-engagement piece, we're gonna talk about that coming up and then make sure in that send goodbye email so that they don't go, which isn't really about building the list, it's about keeping the list. Make sure you give every opportunity to inspire them to stay. So let's get into that initial part because many of them say that that welcome area and the whole sequencing piece is the most important piece of the whole of your whole marketing, your customer journey. And why is that? Because it's your first impression, right? So many people, I don't know about you guys, but I'll, I, I get on these email lists and I just delete them and I delete them, delete them because I want to stay on them, but I want to be inspired enough at the beginning to go, it's worth it. So even when I get a few other ones, I'm going to go, okay, I'll stick it around because they've gave me a first impression. That's good. So the welcome section is one of the most important. So we're going to focus a little bit more on that, but take what we learn here as far as sequencing and automation and apply it to other parts of your journey. So what is an email sequence? It's basically a series of email templates that are designed with customized content and you schedule them to automatically send whenever possible to the recipient based on the actions, which are triggers that you can send in through MailChimp or whomever. Now, when I say about the automatically, take this with a grain of salt, because if your process, you are not using this and you're not ready to start automation, you can still maintain the sequence. It's just more manual, but I do encourage you whenever automation is possible to do the automation. And that email sequence is going to help move that recipient basically through that defined email marketing funnel that you're going to do in your planning stage because you want to ultimately have that goal. So remember, email marketing is part of your whole marketing. You have to have that goal in mind, whether you're doing social media, website design, mark, email marketing, you all have to have that, that goal in mind. So that's the whole idea of email sequencing. So that we welcome email sequence, what does that actually look like? So basically the website form, we're just going to use that as an example. That is your client touch point. So you're going to hear that term a lot, that client touch point. Website form, it comes there. You've done all your marketing, you've driven it to the website form to gather that email list, which is your audience. 
And then possibly you've decided, and this is just an idea, um, that as soon as they sign up, it's going to go to a confirmation page saying, hey, thanks for signing up to our email list. You are now going to please check your email and it is, um, it's going to be in there in that way. We'll confirm that you're on a list. Please do it. There'll be a little more instructions and then they're going to go to the email. So then after that, so basically the trigger sets up that it goes to the landing page and then an automated um, double opt-in goes to the email. Double opt-in is really important. Um, a lot of people don't do it and it's it's still optional, but what the value is of the double opt in that confirmation email and you're going to see them more and more now than ever is because you need to verify you need to tell your email service provider that that email is something you actually wanted. So by clicking on it, it tells your email service provider that it's safe. Um, the other thing you can do too as part of the instructions in that double opt-in is you can either have them reply to it or you can actually um, put instructions, hey, please add us to your safe sender list. And that all of that is helping you improve your deliverability. Because if that email service provider says, hey, they're engaging with me, then that way it's more likely to get into their inbox rather than their junk mail. So it's really important if you have that opportunity to set up that double opt-in email. And then from there, you can set up triggers and go, okay, once they've opted in, now we're gonna have some welcome emails go out. It's like, welcome, thanks for joining our group, blah, blah, blah. And we're gonna actually talk. I'm gonna show you some examples of what a welcome email looks like. And then maybe at the very end, you have a final welcome landing page on your website. Because what's the magic of all of this and, and the website, and I will always say this, is the hub of all your marketing. And that way you're doing all your marketing and it lands on your website. Now you can start tracking from these landing pages with your Google Analytics as well. So that could be the final place where that's the ultimate goal that you've set up. Now, does that make sense to you guys? Um, I am gonna just double check on, don't forget to please put in questions to all panelists. If you send something privately to me and it's a question you need me to answer, uh, Mona is monitoring our emails and she will bring them forward. So just, you might have to put it in again. So on that note, we've actually got a, a question that okay. came in. Mm -hmm. um, they're asking, why is the final welcome landing page necessary if the customers have already received their welcome email? It's not, none of, none of that is necessary. This was just a scenario that, um, that I potentially could do. And really it the, the most important out of this is the double opt-in email and the the one welcome email. Those landing pages are just extra things that if you want to start leveraging your website, because maybe that final welcome landing page goes to products that they're purchasing, or maybe you've embedded it into the welcome email and that's okay. It just depends on what your strategy is. So not necessary whatsoever. The only one is the double opt-in and recommended well, at least one welcome email. Could even be a series of them. Hope that helps. Okay, awesome. thanks. All right. Yeah, that's all for right now. Thanks, Mona. Okay, so here's an example. And I did, I took this off a blog, Constant Contact actually did a whole bunch of these. So these were not coming in for me. So please check out this blog for a whole bunch of other examples. But one of the ones that they showed it, so basically your double opt-in and then this is the welcome email that comes after. Is the glasses company free stuff? Well, that's a great tag, right? Like free stuff, everyone wants free stuff. So you've pulled me in. The design is super simple. And what their strategy here is what they wanted is for you to start following them on social. So they've taken that email and they're going, okay, you like us on email. We also want you to do Facebook and, and Instagram. So that was their strategy for their welcome. These guys, the cycling company, they wanted people to start um, selecting their preferences because what these preferences are are segments within your audience list. So they send it out, they say hi, they've given all the main information and having had a cycling company, that totally is important to make sure that they know how to get there as well as your hours. But I also know that in the cycling world, there's a lot of stuff that's available. Um, and this lets them fine tune what kind of emails to send to them. I also might, if it was mine in my world, there is um, like, do you do you mountain bike or do you road cycle? Do you um, 
you know, are you also an off-road runner? Like there's kind of things like that because all of a sudden now are these the kinds of things you want to learn about? And that way, so if I have a, a, a new mountain bike that's come out, I would go, okay, I'm only going to send it to the mountain bike people because that's what they want. Because there's, it's a very different group roadies and uh, mountain bikers um, so that you just want to make sure that you're giving that personalized experience and this is a great opportunity to capture them right away and then these guys are just showing a code so they want to sell right away so basically it's one of those and you see that a lot too right um, they you sign up for our email list and you will get 10 percent off your first purchase and then this welcome email goes out and it gives you the code to use in the e-commerce area at the back end and just think through the whole um the whole process and really as much as we do the planning session until you actually get it up there and and test it out it's hard to know what it looks like um, but those are three examples and if you want to learn more about sequences, I did a whole blog. I just finished it up and it is posted on my website. So even if you go to lauradunkley.com and go to blog, it's currently one of the, um, it's the top one there. So it takes you through all the different things and why to that landing page question too. Um, if I built out that strategy, why potentially would I have a landing page in there? There's some more information. So. It's all free over there. And also you guys will get a planning template and this is use it for whatever section. But basically what I would say is take it and copy and paste and do this before you get into any of the other tools, which I'm going to show afterwards. And what I would suggest is that top part is that planning that goals, the budgets, other considerations that keeps it all in one place. The subscribe form, for example, timing, um, you know, because it happens, it's automatically, you could put auto in there. What kind of message do you want on it? What's the call to action? Because you have to have one, at least one primary, don't have too many calls to action, usually just one. The campaign UTM. So that's that URL that we're going to touch base on later. If there is a tracking campaign you want to use, it could be Google, it could be Bitly, whatever that might be. And then um, a link to graphics. We use Canva. Sometimes a link is easier to drop in rather than the image itself. And this is meant to be a planning one because what will happen, and I've done this, when you go in to go into MailChimp or whatever and you go, oh, okay, I want a welcome email. It's like, oh, I don't know what to write, right? So you want to make sure that you have at least a starting point here before you go up. So I do recommend it. It is free and we'll send a link out to you. So setting up your audience. And some of you are new too. This is totally appropriate. Uh, I'm using MailChimp. Again, go back to whatever you end up using. It will look similar. I have blocked out any private information, so that's not available. So you will see something like this. If you see the little check mark and it says activate the archive bar for this audience, what ah uh, that is, is that lets you be able to view the email in a browser. Optional, but I definitely have found it to be helpful. And when you create your audience, these are the things you have to think about. You have to name it. You have to put in an email address from whom and that URL setting, you can have it generate um, automatically, or that's where you can start to put in your campaign URLs. And then the reminder for how they found your, how you got on this list. Really important, this is part of the castle reinforcement, the language around this, just remind them, maybe you've done something from a trade show, or um, I know we've done it for the digital marketing. It's you receiving this because you are part of a digital marketing series or you've been a client or whatever that might be put in the language. They do allow you from one audience to another to copy and paste. So it does help. And you also need a physical address. That's part of um, compliance as well. And then this is where if you GDPR matters um, for your strategy, make sure that you click on this. Enable dot double opt-in, this is where you, I recommend, some of them um, automatically do it, but I would suggest you do it to let you know, um, as far as the authentication going back to the email address, you definitely wanna make sure you have an email address that is not at Gmail, at Hotmail, you have to have an owned domain. You cannot authenticate something that doesn't have an owned domain. So. I would suggest getting that set up before you even sign up for MailChimp to do that. 
And then how often do you want to get notified? By your subscriber list. So you can click on that option. And this is what your audience will look like once you do that. If there are no contacts, um, it's going to look like this. And this is where you're going to start to build out your sign up forms and all of the other great stuff. A welcome message when you do do any type of campaign welcome message, it's going to look similar to this. You're going to send it to a particular audience or segment. Um, and then you will select that you're going to say who it's from. And that, you know, make sure that you verify that email address. You're going to put in your subject with a little heading and then you're going to go in to create your content. Remember that these examples that I'm showing you is with the paid paid subscription you will get in mailchimp does allow and and many of them do allow a free um, startup but with a lot of limitations for them they have um, marketing you'll see marketing at the bottom or you're limited to one audience or certain features won't be you will have to evaluate your budget for doing this and figure out what works right for you but all of the examples here are shown through the paid and your forms. So when you're ready to sign up that sign up form, this is one of the first things you're going to do is there's different ones, right? There's the form builder that you're going to do. There's embedded forms and embedded form is something you're going to embed right into your website. You're going to have your code that's there. And then there's also a subscriber pop up that will show up on your website that you can do. And then they also have contact form because these guys have moved into the CRM world, the sales world, which a lot of them have done that. Depending on what you want to do in your strategy, know that a lot of times once you build that form, they'll have an embed code or they'll have a link. If you do something like WordPress or Squarespace and things like that, you just take that code. If you have an extra plugin that works better with your website, you can build it into that. I know I use Elementor. Uh, on WordPress and there is in under the Elementor too, there's a, there's an email subscriber and I just have to put the code in. So that gets into the website world, but first you can't even do that until you get your email marketing form in place. And what does that look like? So this is where you start to build out your sign up forms. There's different ones you can choose the opt in. It makes it super easy because it'll take you through all the different ones to build out. And as an example, this is our subscribe, our sign up form that we use on our website. Similar, um, I may have slightly been updated, but what you want to make sure is that you brand it properly, right? It has logo, you have the thing. Now it depends again on what that is. We have it just redirecting to a URL, but you have to figure out your design strategy. But if it's directed to a URL, this is the strategy that we've used. We have the castle, all the legalities put in there, make sure you have that. And then all the fields that you wanna fill out. Um, we've asked a few extra, right? Industry, um, are you located in Mississauga? And then if you see the subscription options below, those are the segmented lists. So for us, we have general e um, economic development office business news as well as small business news because not everyone wants all of our entrepreneurial um, information so this is where your segmentation can start as well and then they subscribe and when they subscribe then you can start to set up triggers just one example of many that are out there for that since we're still on this topic, Laura, yes. um, I just want to bring up a question that was brought up. So for email campaigns, which is better, MailChimp or HubSpot? Oh, I cannot answer that. I got to watch my time here because everything is different, right? Um, HubSpot, and we're going to talk about that too, because that's one of the tools I'm going to mention below. It's um, there's a strategy behind that as you integrate your CRM, right? And as you build out your tech stack, as you grow your organization, Think through, even when you're small, what you want to do and always think you're going to scale. So even if you're a one man show, when you're putting that tech stack together, assume you're going to have 10 people on staff. I mean, I'm about dreaming big, right? Um, so 10 years, maybe it's 10 and then 20. And how are you going to scale that? There's a certain point, though, where your tech stack, you'll get to a, a critical point where you'll have to change it over. But in that those early stages, as you're still the small business, there's still that room to grow. And so HubSpot has is mostly a. They actually started out as marketing way back in the old days, and then they added the sales, the CRM onto it. 
email MailChimp also has the um, CRM attached to it, right? It's marketing. So you're going to see a lot of these changes, especially in the last year or two. Um, a lot of softwares have accelerated. So you have to first go back and, and figure out what works for your process. What do you need before you think about the, the tools? And this is um, uh, something common I see amongst everyone. So just think of your whole business plan and your strategy and as you build that out and think about what you need and then go out and start to source it. So integrated makes sense, but sometimes if it doesn't make sense because one solution, um, if you're, if there are, and I've seen this, the sales company, um, if maybe it's a sales, um, a CRM is a customer relationship management tool. It's used to manage your sales strategy, right? And then they tack on marketing, but they don't do a great marketing job. So you're going to go, well, MailChimp does really does a good job here. Um, and then I'm going to have this one. Do they talk to each other? So there's a way to actually connect them. Is it better to have one solution or do I start connecting multiple different solutions? You may have to get help. This is where you will want to talk to. That's kind of my world as far as communication strategies and building out processes and making sure you consider it. But I always make sure because I'm not an IT expert that I would call in my IT person and say, okay, mm -hmm. is that the right thing? So. My point being is that there's not one solution that's perfect for everyone. Go back to your plan, go back to your processes, and then look to the tools and start to build out your stack. Okay, I hope that helps. And then we've got another question that came in. Um, okay. How does the integration work? For example, if you have Shopify and the themes come with the built-in sign-up section, usually at the bottom of the page and the pop-up, when the customer clicks on the subscribe link on the website, do the customers see the MailChimp template you made? That is a very specific question mm -hmm. because there's so many things and I would encourage you to actually, we can take that offline. Um, reach out to me independently and we can set up a consultation to run through your process and run through Shopify because there's so many other options. I know Clavio is the big one that uh, Shopify works well with. Um, and then there's different, it just depends on your sign up form. It depends how you've set up your Shopify site, um, your all your triggers. Um, I would have to say, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd love to go over that with you in more details. Okay, awesome. Okay. And that's all for now. All right, thanks Mona. All right, so if you have an existing audience or you're thinking about this is, um, and you haven't started yet, put this in as part of your management um, plans. So what you want to do on this is um, just make sure we keep it clean. And a lot of people don't do this. As your email list starts to build out, you're gonna get 10, you're gonna get 100, and you're gonna get out of control because then all of a sudden now you have all these sales and you're working on your business and your management and you don't go back into the back end and um, have a look at who's doing what on your email list. So please set aside time in your marketing plan to evaluate your email list and go through a, a bit of a cleanup. And that's what we're going to talk about here today. So how do you do that? You go into your all contacts and you're going to see things like this, right? You're going to have, now I've blocked out the email address, first name and last name for privacy, but also you'll see all the options in here is those are those segments that I'd mentioned. And if you see those little yellow and green things, um, unsubscribed, that person has unsubscribed. Then we have subscribed and we have unsubscribed. We don't have any cleaned on this screenshot, but you'll also see cleaned. Before you do anything, make sure you export your list as a backup. Doesn't mean you have to keep them because you have to then manage all that private information. But as you go through this process, my recommendation is put it somewhere securely, but as a backup if something happens. And then you go, after that, you, ex you go into your segments. So based on the audience that we're talking about, you now go into your segments and you have a look and you have options to create segments. And those segments, those three key segments to do, you want a subscribed, an unsubscribed, and cleaned. And based on this is how you're going to manage and clean up your list. Subscribes, they're great, they're wonderful, um, and those are the ones that are engaging and they're happening, right? Um, but again, there's even a deeper dive afterwards. But we want the subscribed, the unsubscribed, we don't want them anymore. 
Like we don't need to keep them on the list. Now MailChimp doesn't charge you for the unsubscribed. You'd have to double check. But really at the end of the day, you want to clean them up because you cannot email them. You cannot go back and figure out unsubscribed and hey, I'm just going to I'm going to email to them anyways and say, hey, come back, come back and do a re-engagement. It's too late. So based on Castle, you cannot do that. You must after 10 days based on Castle, not email them again. You have to take them off your list. So to be compliant, you need to do that for what cleaned is. And many people don't understand what that is when. Um, MailChimp does this, and probably the other ones too, a hard bounce. So what a hard bounce is, is if it goes and there's no email there, it's not real, it's not authentic, they've closed it down, they've deleted it, whatever that is, it comes back and MailChimp marks it as cleaned, but it's not unsubscribed, it's just cleaned. And too many soft bounces, that's if they if they get emailed and it says auto, it's there's an auto response um, to it, or if it's just uh, goes into the spam, whatever that might be, if they do too many of those, they're going to also notice notify you and say it's cleaned. Those are the ones you really want to take care of because it doesn't mean they're unsubscribed. Technically, you can still send them, but really, we want the whole idea is um, to actually archive them. And I'm going to show you what that happens. But how you do that is you go in and you start to segment. So then once we go in and see how I've done this, we've cre created these segments, different cleans, and then now I'm gonna go back into the segments and I'm gonna delete those unsubscribed. You just click and delete. Now we have the backup. So if something happens, right, until we get rid of the backup, it's still there. So you unsubscribe. And then we let's gonna look at the cleaned list. And that's where you wanna review, you wanna edit, and then delete the ones that aren't right. And what that might be, is you want to go back and it might be a bit of a manual process. So that's why we say do it as do it often. It's kind of like comments on your website, right? Don't leave it till there's thousands of comments on there and you crash it because you've deleted them. Stay on top of this and it's not such a big deal. So there's sometimes people just put in typos and then they they didn't realize, you know, that they did it. Maybe it's, and I see this all the time, Gmail, G-M-I-L rather than A-I-L. And so th that way, um, you can actually put it in and, and switch that typo and now it's clean because it's obvious that that was a typo. There's also um, contact information. If you're not sure about it, you can click on that contact information and go into more details. It's amazing the details. Now we can start seeing, okay, uh, all the private information's out of here, we're good. Um, but the last one was a hard bounced. There's soft bounces, then there's a hard bounce. It's like, okay, obviously this email is down. There's only one star. It hasn't been engaging for a while. This person should be going to the delete or the um, not necessarily delete. It might be an archive, but the likelihood it's not a real address. So we want to get rid of it. Um, so what you can do from this is actually segment it further. So maybe we go, okay, these are ones I'm not sure. And we're going to go in and check it. Maybe then these are ones that we want to do an engagement because they haven't been engaging. Those are just, that's kind of the process to go through to clean it up. It is a bit, but I do encourage you to do it. So this is part the beginning of that re-engagement we mentioned. Once you have that cleaned list, like not the, the totally that quality list, because you've done all the process, you've gotten rid of the deletes, you've gotten rid of the typos. And now we want to actually go into those ones that aren't engaging. And that's where we dived down a little bit further, right? And in the segment, it gives you an option if you want to pull out all of those people that haven't engaged in the last 12 months, because definitely in the last 12 months, um, you, there's a problem, right? But you don't want them to unsubscribe. So let's figure out and create a segment based on that. And then we're going to set out email campaigns. So how do we re-engage them? What do you do? What do you say, right? Um, there's ways to use it. Polls and surveys work well. Giveaways, contests, maybe you're willing to invest some to bring them back into the fold. Coupons or promo code codes, or maybe you just did this whole process and like in the bike shop world, um, our season um, right before spring was important. We're coming up to the holiday season based on this time we're getting recorded. So this is a perfect time to do this because you want to push out that product to the right people. So maybe this is the kind, it's like you give them a special discount because they've been inactive. And, uh, and that works really, it has worked really well. And then once they do that, once they click on it, 
then all of a sudden now they're part of the active, right? So it will be taken off that inactive segment. It's, it's amazing once you start to put in these parameters. Um, the other thing you can do is, um, is put an automation. If they don't click on it after a certain period of time, you can add, actually add them to an unsubscribe um, because it's better to have quality list rather than quantity. So please don't forget that. It's the same in social media. Um, quality is really important. Um, you can also put in at that point too to update their profile link, if that makes sense. So what I would say is once you've do, done, done these re-engagement campaigns, it could be more than one, um, go in and take the selected contacts. Maybe they just didn't re-engage, but they didn't unsubscribe. So the joy is now you don't have to add them to an unsubscribe list. You can just archive them. Now, when you archive them, technically, so MailChimp, and I just had to double check this, at this time they said archived ones you don't have to pay for. So if you have 25 or 3,000, all of a sudden you realize there's 1,000 um, that aren't being used and they're not engaging, you wanna save some money, just archive them. Now you can bring them back in, it just means you can't update the profile at any point, um, but they're not unsubscribed, you don't have to pay for it. Just an option of what you can do. And, okay. Performance and deliverability and engagement is the big thing. People say all the time, you know, it's like, how, how do I ensure that there is my, my emails are actually delivering to them and why aren't they engaging? Well, there's some tips for that. So first off, we talked about double opt-in, make sure you add it to your welcome series and include that welcome email, right? It's that first impression um, that you get and it takes them through, it's a nudge right through, through that funnel. Um, make sure they can reply to your email. There's nothing worse than having the do not replies. Please, I do encourage you, even if you are a not-for-profit or a larger organization, make sure there's someone on the other end of that email that can subscribe, can reply to it. That gives another signal to that service provider, That's which means a higher percentage of getting through. Authenticate that domain, as I mentioned, and only own domains can be authenticated. Make sure you provide value. Don't just keep throwing out the same thing. This is where it goes back to know your audience. Really be specific on knowing your audience and knowing what they want based on the stage and their activities. So think about value, good content strategy there, follow design best practices. Mobile's so important. There is an option when you do your campaign designs to view on desktop and view on mobile. Do it every time. The last email I just went out, um, it was really funky and I'm so glad I checked the mobile and I had to redesign it because some of the, the lines weren't showing up properly on mobile. So please test um, and keep it simple, quality images. Make sure to what you can do, and this is saving time, this is one of those saving time tricks, is uh, I take my campaigns and I will copy them. Right, duplicate it because then all of a sudden that template is there. There's a lot of content. I just want to keep the layout and I just need to switch out pictures and switch out text. Remember, if you do that though, that images have links or they should have links, right? Because it's easier on a mobile to click. Make sure you check if you put in a new image, it doesn't change the link. So you have to go through and check each image has the right link. Make sure they're there and they're the right link. And then use buttons. Sometimes it makes sense to just, depends on what the layout is, that you might wanna just have text. But remember the read more when it's really little is hard to see. So if it's a one single call to action, it's one designated campaign, make sure it's big and it's bold. Uh, keep it interesting, capture their attention, same as that welcome email we saw, right? Like it says, hey, freebies. Um, that's always a good thing to do. Text is important. A lot of email service providers do not show the images right away. Um, I know for our Outlook, it defaults so that the images are not there and I have to download the images to see it. So the only thing I see is the text. So make sure that your email campaigns can stand alone with just text really important for getting engagement. Know your audience, personalize it, use segments, use meta tags, like there's little tags where they can say, add in the first name based on it. Use those whenever possible. Um, test your emails, as I mentioned before sending them, you can test one to yourself, see what it looks like. Frequency matters, know what works. 
um, make sure you keep them engaged. Don't don't decide to do email marketing campaign and then leave it for six months. I'm guilty as charged on some of my stuff and it's hard to do and maintain that constant content, but make sure you're in front of them regularly, uh, but not too frequently. And you'll have to watch your results and look at start with your industry to see what works. Send small batches if you have a large audience. Uh, MailChimp lets you send out and they'll do it for you. Um, you can also a B test, which you maybe you want to change an image and you can actually split a campaign that works well too. And then make sure that you do build and maintain that quality list. Do that, um, that cleanup, that, that management series that we just talked about, that will definitely help with all of those. That is a lot. And I'm going to keep going. It's 11. We're awesome. Okay. Email marketing. Now, how do we know it's working? Right, basically, this is the funnel. This is the overall funnel. But as I mentioned, it's this kind of cyclical thing. But we're, as you'll always see through this, you're going to basically start and nurture them. You want to convert them to customers and retain them. There are key performance metrics throughout all of these, um, and we can start to sparse them out. But I just wanted to show you some some basic ones to review. So generally speaking, the number of subscribers and the number of campaigns you put out those are very general. Kind of you want to still track them. I'm a big fan of using a spreadsheet. I have yet to been using a spreadsheet for years and I haven't found anything better um, to track because it is trending. So I have spreadsheets where it'll actually show us where we started three, four years ago. Um, it's nice to know it, see the pattern. I truly believe the truth is in the trends, not in every single campaign I send out. And I want to also be inspired. Like if we've been doing this for a year, it's sometimes you forget. It feels like a grind. Keep your metrics to inspire you and go, I have come a long way. And then you can start to put all of your metrics together because as I mentioned, email marketing has to be part of your whole marketing strategy cannot stand on its own. So having that central place to track your metrics is important. So subscribers, number of campaigns you put out, um, email campaigns themselves, you want to see how many people that you actually sent to, how many, and I didn't put that on here, how many were actually delivered, and that goes back. You'll notice that will change, right? You're going to get fewer bounces and more deliverables um, once you clean your list. How many were opened? What's that percentage of opens? How many people clicked and percentage of click? I'm going to show you a report that gets a little more granular, but if you're going to track anything, the basics, that's them. Google Analytics is another place to track some of your metrics because that website, right, is the hub. And basically, if that's where all your product is, you want to drive traffic there and then start to walk through where they went and did they actually purchase. So traffic to the website, your campaign URL is there. Um, and referral traffic traffic is part of the dashboard that you can find those metrics. How much time did they spend on your website after they came? I'm a big fan of that. Or did they bounce right off? Like if they bounced off, there is a problem, and this doesn't just do email marketing, this is for all your advertising. If you're finding your campaigns, you're spending a lot of money, and they come and you get these huge bounces, right? You can't tell from, um, Email marketing report won't tell you, right? Like it just tells you that they've clicked over, but the website putting it all together, the website will say, it's like all of a sudden there's lots of bounces and you're going, well, okay, there's something wrong. There's disconnect between my messaging here and what I'm delivering them to. And that's a chance to retweak your marketing. So check the time they spend, how many page views did they see after they spent there, which means your website design, right? Is taking them through properly through the funnel. And that we're going to talk about on Tuesday's website 201, um, but that bounces and then there's goals. So the goals on your Google analytics campaign, you can set all of that up to based on the goals of your email marketing. The other things too you want to track is your actual return on investment. Take the revenue you've made from your email marketing campaign and how much did you put against it. So often if you want, we, we miss that, right? We don't get that true value of what we're putting into it. So your budget spent on a campaign is the services. If you hire someone, which I will tell you, many of you are actually doing it on your own and I commend you for that. But as you grow, you cannot do marketing on your own. You just can't and scale. Marketing is so um, time consuming now and so critical to the, the process. And there's so many different um, facets of marketing that you need a team. 
what that team looks like is going to depend on what you need as an organization and how you scale, but it's really important. I do have also a blog on that with a bunch of resources if you're building your team. So check out my um, the lauradunkley.com blog for that. Um, so services that you hire someone, how much money did you spend for advertising and did you offer incentives? So all of, all of a sudden you're doing a percentage discount for sign up, make sure you take that into consideration in the budget you're spending towards your email marketing. The other things you can check and uh, I'll show you in the report is your email marketing. I'll tell you what country gets clicked on different demographics when they've opened, how many times they clicked on things very rich um, as far as um, stats. Then you also want to track what kind of content is being clicked what's working, how much different things like all of that content piece. Um, and then what time of day are you sending things? Whether you start with the benchmark is great. Maybe Friday, right? We mentioned Friday, but now you're finding you're going to try different times of the day, different times of the week, um, figure out what works best for you. And that's all part of the reporting and you want to track. So Google Analytics, I mentioned, if you don't have that set up on your website, I would recommend doing that. There are also things like Squarespace and Wix, those site builders that have built in metrics, but they're very limited. Google Analytics is free and I highly recommend um, you getting started with that. And if you want to really dig down deep, that campaign you're a builder I mentioned, it's, it's integrated into your MailChimp, but you can also do it separately. And you just have to go here at this URL. And basically what this does, it lets you track your campaign. What campaign marketing campaign you're doing? Where did the, where did the source come from? Is this your newsletter? is and then um the campaign id you can put in terms different terms so basically for this the url i created i have a download on my website about how to do a communications assessment so i put in my url and then i named it fall newsletter and so that's the source that's this whole campaign um well, for this, that's like, it's the newsletter. The campaign medium is e-newsletter. Now I could put MailChimp, that could make sense too. Um, there's a whole description on this URL to understand these terms better. And then the campaign name, I've named it communications assessment download. It generates a URL, I plug it in. I know many of you have seen this when it pops up when you click on links. That way it can track right in my Google Analytics and I can actually start to see an entire marketing campaign in one central place rather than pulling a report from here and a report from my social media and having to do it all manual this will send your um this will save you time but start to make sure you track all your urls in um, in a central place as well so that's a little trick there and i'm going to show you what it looks like so when you go into your google analytics and you open up your dashboard under acquisition, because basically that's how it's coming through, you're going to put in all campaigns and the campaign names are good. They're all going to show there. I just for privacy, I didn't put them in and you can name them specifically and they actually start show up there and you can see what ones are acquired, the behavior if they once they've linked on it, where did they go in the website conversions? And then there's goals also there it takes a bit to set these up. It's definitely not for the ones you guys just starting out, but if you do have time or you have someone you can hire to do this, um, it's well worth the effort um, if you're doing a lot of email marketing or any of your marketing campaigns. So reporting from MailChimp, this is one of the MailChimp reports and I have no doubt all your other ones have this too. You'll see table of content, it's quite robust. The recipients, you're going to see how many people opened, the clicks, the bounce, the unsubscribed, the time of day, your, your industry average, all of that is part of the report. And you can even see what country, um, what country did it come from? And then this again um, is, is covered up, but under the subscribers that had the most open, now you can start to see who's, who's has the most activity. And you can also see what URLs are getting tracked and what ones are getting opened more. Like for us, when we do our webinar ones that go out, it's like, okay, so this webinar is really popular. How come this one's not popular? Is it because of a popularity or do we need to change the image or do we need to change the text as our button? So this gives you that opportunity for you take that data, you readjust, you evaluate it, and then you adjust your next campaign accordingly. And even when they've opened it. Okay, before we go on into that, any questions? Oh, 
there is a question about a b testing ah okay i'm going to go back to uh, actually you don't need to you don't need to see anything a b testing when you set up a campaign it will give you an option do you want to a b test it a b testing though isn't just in email marketing it's in all of your social media uh, you've probably seen it if you've done a facebook ad and things like that and what that allows is you get to do an a and a B option. So, and you, you have to, you don't want to change a ton of things, but basically it's to test your campaign. For example, with the email marketing, what you'll want to do is maybe you want to check, check out, um, the campaign to send out on Monday versus Tuesday. And so you send out the campaign, you put all the parameters into MailChimp and they'll send out one on man, um, to half your subscribers, random subscribers depending on your settings, but you're, you're to a certain amount of subscribers on Monday and then, and then on Tuesday, they're going to set it out to another one and you can actually track their two separate email campaigns. They keep it all together and you go, oh, what's working the best? It's magic. Like really it's awesome because you get to take that data and you, and you start to, to evaluate. It's just, it's taking it down to that next level right now make sure this is the key when you do a b testing only change one variable or else you don't know what's working so you decide i'm going to change the time of day or i'm going to change the day of the week or i'm going to change an image or i'm going to change a header like only do one thing at a time because then you'll know that header works that doesn't doesn't work and then you can take it out you can have multiple campaigns it does take time but it does give you some valuable information does that help Awesome. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's get into this example. This is our garden grows company. You're going to see this through our social media tool one. It's used in the digital marketing um, boot camp that we did. And actually part of the digital marketing boot camp is the logo was different. And so when we did social media tool one, we did a rebrand. So it's kind of our, our little test company. And what it is, it's a gardening company. They are now focused, they do, they sell things, they do workshops, they do a bunch of different things. We're coming up to the holiday season. What do they wanna promote? Workshops and floral arrangements. So let's have a look. Now, we do have some B2B guys. And, um, you guys are on here that are services. These guys are products, but they're also doing services. So the, the principles still work, whether you're not for profit, for profit, um, selling services or selling products. You first wanna take that situational analysis, including your own. So this is where you might not do this if it's you, but I would say put down some points. If you're going to start to work with a marketing agency or a freelancer or even a marketing employee, you want to make sure that they bring to you this information so you can review it. And basically what it is, it's an overall strategy, a snapshot. What channels are they using? How are they using the channels? What is that core content? What kind of um, things are they going to send out? We're going to talk about that more and basically the budget. So these guys have newsletters. They use social media. They use visit um, video. They have $500 a month for digital advertising and they have an internal team to help them. So that's the situation. The business goal, always, always be clear that it's your business goal. Your marketing strategy has to support your business goal. And when you do things like your email plan, it's a nested strategy. It has to support your marketing. Your marketing supports your business goal. Always make sure it rolls up because that's why you're doing it. Because marketing, if it doesn't help you make money, it's it's just um, money spent and there's no effort, um, a lot of effort for not, no return. So always make sure it's focused on that business goal. So what do they want to do? They want to increase the revenue by 20% from new business sales by December 31st. So we've identified what that, um, what that um, success looks like and by when, and that's important. So a marketing plan, let's get this is all, uh, the general marketing plan, you have your goals, you've identified an audience, you've talked about what kind of content you're going to use, you're going to talk about the distribution, and you're going to figure out how you're going to measure success. So for these guys, they have put down goals. They want, they have a 10,000 sales for the holiday seasons, what they're saying. What's their marketing goal? They want to promote in-season flowers and workshops between October and December make sure it's realistic and manageable when you do it um, that's where people get overwhelmed by the plan 
and they go, oh, I can't think the whole year. Let's just talk about this quarter. And that's where I say, let's just get started, get that chunk in. So they need to deliver so much before the end of, by December 15th or whatever that is, um, and be very specific. So they're gonna promote in-season flowers and workshops. They're gonna do one thing and one thing well, rather than worried about their whole business. They're going to evaluate the audience. Who is it? It's their current customers, friends of customers, local people interested in flowers, and maybe they're going to focus on hotels. Maybe that's a lot. Maybe you've decided that, okay, that's still too much. Maybe I just want to focus on hotels because we've decided that everything in travels opened up again. People are starting to do it and we know it's working. So make sure you reevaluate your target audience for this um, and then your content. Uh, what, what kind of content do you have? What kind of content can you create before then? What's part of that overall strategy? Because they're doing video how-tos, they have photography, we can get a photographer in, maybe there's a special event, uh, blogs, they're going to start to write holiday theme blogs, they're going to do Facebook and Instagram ads, okay. I have a quarter, I'm gonna do all of this kind of content. You're gonna figure that out as far as your content strategy. You have YouTube, Facebook, this is all happening. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna do, but we're gonna track calls to our flower shop. You notice how all of a sudden now sales is part of this because that's really important. Sales closes it, marketing gets the leads in. Um, Google searches, we're gonna track engagement on social media. Now, based on this, we're just talking about email marketing. So now, we want to track the open subscribes and clicks, but maybe we want to track a few little more. And remember, part of your distribution strategy has been marketing emails. If all of a sudden you haven't been collecting your emails, you don't have email hasn't been a part of a strategy, you have to be realistic. That's where you have to go back to your marketing plan, your marketing strategy, and be realistic. So if I want to if I want to get 10,000 sales, mostly from email marketing, and I haven't even started collecting emails, it's not going to happen between now and December 15th. So make sure that you think of this holistically within what it is. Now, if you're just starting, maybe you change your, your tunes and you say, okay, but I have the opportunity right now because people are interested. Uh, my goal is to build my subscribers. So know where you are. Um, within your strategy and uh, and make sure your email plan is based around that. So let's talk about a scenario. They've been doing this for a while, so we're going to assume they have a bunch of emails already. Their goal, though, is to still build up that email list, which is express consent for marketing, not just from their customer emails, um, from 250 subscribers to 1,000 subscribers by December 1st. To see how specific that is, that's what you want to see. That's how you want to create your goals. Increase the open rate from 5% to 10%. So here's the thing, see how the open rate five to 10%, you know how we do that is we clean up our list because that changes your percentage open, right? All of a sudden now you have a clean list. The likelihood is you're gonna have a better open rate. If all of a sudden these people haven't been engaging and you don't have that, your, your open rate's gonna be down. So all of a sudden now, if you haven't been doing that for a while, that's a quick win. That's a good way to, to bump up your open rate. Um, the other thing they're saying, have 10% of all December 2021 holiday sales from email campaign. So we're going to go, okay, this is serious. We need to do this. We need to holiday sales. We need to make sure we have promotional campaigns in here. Um, and then there's, see how we picked out an audience. We didn't do everyone. We've decided homeowners, corporate clients for this, these, this section, this particular plan. That's what we're going to do. And these are the key metrics we're going to do. And then we have a budget. Make sure you put your budget in your plan. Advertising is $1,000. We're going to build a subscriber list, $500 a month. It still works within what our budget is. Um, you said, remember we said we have $500 worth of budget. Maybe they went, okay, I have a little extra. Um, so I'm going to dedicate all of this money to just put into advertising because we made X amount of sales. Like you can adjust your budget um, over like over your year. So to make sure you, you think that through. Um, so they've decided we're going to put some advertising in and then we're also going to hire some people. So we're going to clean up the list, hire someone to clean up the list and we're going to send out a bunch of campaigns and here's the campaigns we want we have 12 weeks 150 dollars each so that's typically based on my experience 
what I see typically um, to do a general email campaign is about $150. Now you're going to see some more, you're going to see some less. It's just a general ID, ID um, idea. And also these are Canadian dollars. So I'm not sure um, what is it in other countries. I know we have some people from other places watching today. But email campaigns as a guideline, 12 weeks, $150 each. We're going to promote the workshop that they're doing and we're going to send out two. We also do our newsletter that's going to be focused on um, all holiday things. And then we're going to do a promotion specific to certain arrangements that are for sale. And then we've said when we're going to send it and how often. That's it. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, but I do encourage you guys to write it down. This just keeps you focused and there are some planning tools I have to help you with that. Does that help? We do have do you have some questions? Yeah, so one of the ones that came in was, um, what is the important sequence of the type of marketing on a limited budget for a small company? Okay, that's, are we talking about just the plan, a sequence? Okay, so, and again, it goes back to your plan. I'm gonna take that question as I understand it. So sequence, no matter what, once you set it up, and quite often people will get help setting it up. So if you're not great at email marketing and you're not sure, I recommend actually hiring someone to help you if you have it or intern or whatever that is to help you get started. They're gonna help you set up the sequences. They're gonna help you set up some templates and then they're gonna say, okay, so you can just, you just plug in the content and you do it yourself. So it's just front end money for that and go, okay, I can handle that. So then all of a sudden your, your budget is just for your email service provider, your, your software, and you're doing the content and you're doing it yourself. You have to step back and go, okay, what can I do? What am I good at? What am I capable to do to deliver quality product um, and still stay in budget? So that's one scenario. Maybe you're going to take the time to set it all up because you want to think it through. And then you go, okay, I'm, I'm, but I'm at the holidays and I can manage this all myself. So my budget is only for, um, for um, the email service provider, but it's the holiday season. So now it's like, I better, I, I can't do this all myself because I'm busy actually working in my business. That's when I would say, take something like this and, and put some money around this. Most people that I know, once they have it set up, a monthly newsletter is typically what they do from just a sheer marketing perspective. And they will send out once a month if they're a, if you're a, a blogger or, or you're a consultant or things like that, and it's, it's thought leadership that you're sending out, maybe it's once a month you do. Maybe you just do once a month to stay in touch with people and it's more like a newsletter. If you're doing e-commerce, it's a whole nother world, right? Because you're doing a whole drip campaign and then it depends on the kind of product. It depends on the type of year you have to figure through that. There's not one answer. Just go back and do a scenario and figure out what you what you're good at, what you're able to do, and then what you want to achieve. And then go out and talk to some marketing people. Most discovery calls with marketing people are free. And you say, listen, this is what I want to achieve. Don't tell them you want to do all of this. This is really to help you as, as an entrepreneur or an organization understand what they can do. So you're getting the value, right? That makes you a, a better client and you're going to get what you want. So I would say, have an idea of this, tell them kind of your budget and say, listen, I have $500 a month to spend just on email marketing, or I only have 150 for email marketing. They'll consider that within your whole plan and they'll go, okay, so maybe how about we do this and you do this? Maybe you write the blogs and we just set up the email campaign for you. Hope that helps. Okay. So third party software. These are just some that uh, I know, and those are the ones I mentioned above. Clavio is popular with Shopify. Um, you hear them a, a lot, actually. They've been doing a lot of advertising on different podcasts. Um, just one of the ones that's out there. I'm not recommending any of these. These are things you have to evaluate yourself. MailChimp, there's a lot of resources they have on here too. So even if you don't wanna use MailChimp, um, they have a, a ton of blogs. Uh, a Weaver's another one I've seen. I've never used this one um, in constant contact. I've used this with previous clients and myself years ago, but it has been a while. And those are just some of them. You'll have to have a look um, and review yourself. And this is where someone asked about HubSpot. This is where you're going to see a CRM that also has a marketing component. I do recommend 
um, evaluating both solutions. Just remember HubSpot also is one of those ones that has a great freemium at the beginning, but watch the scaling price, right? Because you, you will be growing, you know, that's guaranteed as a successful entrepreneur or organization. And so make sure, is this the right all-in-one solution or do you wanna go the other route and get a CRM and integrate it? Um, integration, can often be done right away. There's an API, they call it, between them. Um, the other one, and I didn't put it on here, is Zapier. They do a lot of integrations between software, but they all start to add up. So make sure you think through all your costs. So HubSpot is one that does both, and Zoho is another one. HubSpot's kind of all-in-one. Zoho is modular. So you can actually start to just add things in. They have a CRM, they have bookkeeping, they have invoicing, they have social, um, all of those things are part of it. And those are just two of many. And then the other part of the planning. So as we remember we talked about the customer journey, this is one of my favorite tools. Love this one. They have a good freemium. Uh, I think you can only do a couple boards. I'm not sure, but check them out. And basically it's your online whiteboard. So if you're like me and love to draw things and take post-it notes and put things together, Miro basically does that online and you can, uh, it's, create, they have a bunch of templates. You could start to create your customer journey template. They actually have one of a few of those and you can start moving things around. The joy of this is you can be anywhere together and start to collaborate. Um, and that is, so if you have a marketing person, they can just do this online or your team. Now that many of us are virtual and dispersed, this is a way to collaborate together and it's good for brainstorming. Asana is a project management tool that we use. I've used it a lot. There's a lot of project management tool. I like the online version, especially now that we're doing virtual. So many people say, oh, but it's just me. I will also say that it's just you, but you might be moving around and you will grow. And it's a great tool to use with marketing agency. You can use it yourself just as an organization tool. And what if you have multiple de devices, right? You can use it on your phone. They have a great phone app. And what this is, is you build out the projects, tasks, work together. Mona and I work together on this one. It's actually, um, it's been great. But there's other tools out there. Reich is one. I can't think of them, but you really just have to probably put in project management online tools and you will find a few. Canva is what we use for graphic design, super simple. Remember in that template I said, hey, just drop in your graphic link. It and These guys allow you to do that. And then we have this other tool. So this is, and I saved this one for the end. I wasn't sure where to put this, but. Basically, it's your MailChimp lets you do the customer journey. So once you've done all your planning, and I do suggest doing your template, maybe using a Miro to plan out your customer journey, and then come into MailChimp and use your customer journey um, mapping. Because what that looks like, not all of them do this, I understand, but MailChimp does, so I'm sure some of them do it. And it lets you drag and drop. So based on your triggers, where it is in the funnel, you can actually start to put things in. If it goes yes, if they say yes, it goes this route. If it says no, it goes this route. When you click on it, it opens it up and you can start to build in your website or in your email campaign. You can put up images, you actually build it while you're doing it. And that's why I say, make sure you do your legwork first before you get in here, because you want to have your images ready and you want to have your process thought through and you want to have your messaging. So that's the order. So someone in the chat was asking about Trello. Yep. Um, Trello is another great one, uh, but I think it just comes down to preference too. Yep. I think with Asana, the, the layout is a lot more user-friendly personally. That's what I find than Trello, but yeah, it just comes down to preference. And honestly, please, you guys are all, um, this is where small group sessions and, and we're hopefully going to get back into the small group sessions. So we'll put that in the feedback survey where we can start to share different ideas because there's so much out there. And the more I do digital marketing, I realize the more you don't know because it's just so vast. And it really comes down to you learn from people that are experts in the field, but you also start to learn from each other. So I, I call you out, you guys drop in the chat right now, if there are tools that you use that you like, we'll definitely bring them forward to the group during the Q&A session. I love it and always open to learn more. So key takeaways, have a plan. We're coming to time. Have a plan, 
know your audience, review your customer journey, build and maintain that quality list. Make sure you do the double opt-in and welcome to make sure you improve for deliverability as well. Set up sequence, save time, um, automate it when possible, and then provide value. That's great content and knowing your audience and knowing what they want within that, um, within that series, the funnel, that you, you are taking them through that journey. Keep it interesting, capture their attention, test it out. If you're not sure if it works, send it to someone, say, hey, does this work? Um, so keep it interesting, segment those lists and keep it personal because you really want to get the right message to the right people at the right time and then measure those results, test, learn, and continue to reiterate. And that is it. So email marketing 201. Thanks everyone. Thank you. That was a great presentation, Laura. Yeah, and we'll take some questions and in the meantime, please um check us out on social facebook instagram linkedin and twitter and our website mississauga.ca slash mbeck and that will actually take there's a link that goes to our other website and there's a whole bunch of resources programs our advisory services where you can um, get some help from us as you you start and scale your business um, as well as send out if you have digital marketing questions um, and you want to want to miss saga business and you want a one-on-one -on -one consultation please reach out to me. Okay, yeah, this is better. <laughs> All right, so someone was inquiring about contact and subscriber forms with consent and whether those could be um, set up on GoDaddy or whether they'd have to uh, set it up on MailChimp and then link it to their website. Ah, uh, the consent. So this is the castle consent. You want to make sure, it depends on the process, right? So you want to make sure that you have um, I, I'll quite often it's a notice, depending on who you are and what your organization we have, it's quite extensive for us. We have a notice of collection as well as that, that subscribe what they're going to get. So we have a link that goes over to, it just, it say, Hey, subscribe to our list. And it goes to MailChimp, which you will find in a browser, right? So that browser has every, that, that in MailChimp has all of our castle castle information, including a link to our privacy policy, contact has to be there, that's part of it, and it's all in that form. So to answer that question, that is one option. You can also have, you can also take that and embed it in your, and I'm assuming when you say GoDaddy, that that is your, your site builder, that's your website, right? So it's whether it's on GoDaddy or it's WordPress or whatever that might be, you might have a landing page that has a subscribe um, that has all of your information on your landing page, and then you have other things within the form. You just have to make sure that if anyone comes back and and complains or says they didn't do things, you, you've put as many things in order. So what you could do is you have it, maybe it's on your website because you wanna track that page. And then you say, hey, subscribe to our list. And then it goes over to, and they send the double opt-in. Remember that uh, confirmation email? And in that confirmation email, you said it again. You're telling them what they're gonna get. Um, what those, what that disclaimer is going to be, and then they have to click on it. And so they've, now they've seen it on your website. They've seen it on your, your double opt in, and maybe it's again in your, your, your email, your welcome email. Basically that's it, but I am not a lawyer. So if you are not sure, make sure that you actually put all of these things in place and you double check it and get legal counsel because at the end of the day, that's what you have to consider. All I'm doing is basic best practices that, um, and then some common sense in there as far as being respectful for who it is. So basically keep that communication open, tell them what they're gonna get, let them know they can unsubscribe at any time. You have to make sure that they can unsubscribe. That is crucial for your castle, that there is an unsubscribe. MailChimp, and that's why I recommend using a third party similar to MailChimp because they have all those castle considerations. They also have the GDPR, so they've thought things through, but it's still your responsibility. Even anything I say and how I, I say it, um, it, you still are responsible to go back at legal counsel and understand the rules yourself. I hope that does help. No, for sure. Okay, so second question. Um, so someone uh, is wondering, whether uh, MailChimp being bought by Intuit is a concern. Yes, that's super exciting. 
concern and I should ask concern. I'm excited because it's a small startup, right? A garage kind of small startup that has gone now purchased by a very large publicly traded organization. Saying that is the concern about the fact that now your all your email information is going to be transferred over to Intuit. Is there some legalities? I can't answer that. Again, I'm, I'm not a, a lawyer. Um, I would hope not, because considering Intuit and the size of the organization, you know, it the due diligence should be on them to make sure all of the GDPR and the transfers and that information is in some place. Again, if you're not sure, please consult a lawyer um, on that. Okay. So we don't have any more questions that came in, but there are a lot of people thanking you for the wonderful yeah. session. Um, Thanks. We can definitely stick around for a few more minutes if anyone has any more questions to ask. Um, feel free to drop that into the chat. Yeah, because we did go over. So thanks everyone for joining. That was a lot of information. We're going to send out that recording as soon as it's done, as well as a link to all the handouts. And uh, again, so if you are a Mississauga business, our, we're here to help you um, start and grow your organization. So um, it doesn't matter what stage you're at, we have a whole team. We have more webinars coming up and you will get all of that emailed to you.